Okay, so you guys ready to get back? Yeah? Okay, so this is the last lecture. It's going to be about clouds. How many of you know or have used clouds? Yeah? How many of you have never used a cloud? Oh, you're lying. If you use Netflix, that's cloud too. <laughs> Okay, so if you don't know what clouds are and why you need them, and I mean, why is it different from a high performance computing and so on, um, if you're thinking like this, essentially, that you have a need more power than a supercomputer or like the cluster that you have, or you basically hate command line and want a more like friendlier interface to start with, um, or you just want different stuff, like high performance computing cluster is not essentially the answer, and you want something that doesn't have job queues or a job schedule. Run stuff like computers. That's when you use the cloud. Um, it's flexible computing resources, um, and basically, there's no admins waiting for you. You can spin up a virtual computer and break it down however nicely you want, or damage it the way you want. And if you think, okay, this doesn't make any sense, and like you know, you're, it's a irreversible mistake, read it. Restart a new virtual computer and go ahead and get started. Um, this is especially useful for someone who's just starting out with uh, high performance. Or command line because it's less intimidating. Like we have undergraduate RDU students that work with us, and it's a great way to get them started because it's, it's not as scary anymore. They're not scared of the system admin emailing them and saying, You're using this in the wrong way. Go ahead and read the documentation because nobody is actually um, managing this in that aspect. And it's also the scary bit the more you learn because nobody's managing it. You can actually do whatever you want, open up security loopholes, and let people hack you. That's all possible. This is Jetstream. Um, it's an XC computer. It's an XC program. So half of it sits at IU and half of it sits at uh, Texas Computing, uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, it has these nice blue walls to say it's happy. For example, I think last semester there was a water leak somewhere down. So typically, big computers you have water that goes through them, um, and some water got into the cluster. So the entire panel turned red. It was very angry. It, it was like I have a lot of fun when it turns red because I think it's funny. But the system admins were not so happy about me laughing over there. Um, to give you an idea of what these clusters and like physically how they're located, this is I use um, yeah, I use Jetstream, and that is Pittsburgh's supercomputing cluster, and that's Texas. You can see how they're all connected in different places. You don't have to be at the physical location to access them. You can sit here right now and access SACS computers, or you can sit here and access supercomputing. Um, that's just to show you how they're not to be in a geographical location. you are not limited anymore based on geography. They're not identical. The other thing to remember is in your high performance computing space, all your compute nodes are identical. They can only do as many things. In your cloud computers, you can build up a virtual computer and you can actually have it do different things. Like you can have right now um, 10 different virtual computers that are doing 10 different things. Like I can have one that's exclusively to teach all you learning, another one that's uh, hosting a Geo browser for my organization and another one that's doing something specialized with another project. Clouds are not often run on virtual machines, so if any of you have heard about VMbox or VMware that you've installed on your computer right now to, in, to have command line access, essentially clouds let you think about, think about it that way. It's just a virtual cluster. Another way to visualize this is you take your personal computer, you take stuff off your personal computer because your computer is angry at the amount of work you're giving it, you pack up everything, like your data and the small things that you did, and you go camping to the place. You go, you spin up a, a tent or a virtual cluster, like think of each of these tents as a virtual computer. If you want a small one, you spin up a small one, go ahead and start doing your data analysis there, or in this case, live there for a while. And if you're not happy with it, you can actually go pitch a bigger tent and you can start doing your analysis. So that's how, think about um, cloud computing that way, or like virtual machine. And of course, if you're doing this on a long-term basis, you probably want something a little more stable. You want to think about uh, who has access to these clusters, you know, maintaining this uh, particular VM and so on. Okay. Any questions? So because the cloud, uh, the campground itself is a shared space, your virtual cluster, your virtual computer or your uh, virtual machine is not. That is only solely owned by you and only but the campground itself is a shared space. So you, there are some rules again to it. You must sign up with an allocation. You need to have an allocation in order to access this campground, which basically means you need to have an Xseed account, which is go to XC 
Jetstream.com right now and make a user account. That's as simple as that. But in order to get access to Jetstream, you need to actually submit a reason as to why you need Jetstream to connect. So um, you can start off with just saying a trial allocation and you get a limited amount, amount of resources to just play around and see if you like it. And if you do and want to use it for a full size project, you need to submit a reason for why you need it, how, many, how much resources you need. It's free, but you need to explain why you need it. That's what it's for. Um, you need to maintain your own security. Uh, it's undermined, and I don't think about it as often well, but then I think um, Bitcoin mining is a big thing. So if your computer, if your virtual machine has a loophole, somebody will find their way into it and start Bitcoin mining. And you're not allowed to do that on any such process. So the system admins do do a sweep every day to check on who's doing you know, stuff that they should not be doing. Um, I don't know what the rules are there, but they'll check on like, any unnecessary, I guess, access to websites and any Bitcoin mining going on, and they will email you. And then here's the problem. We own the allocation. We'll give all of you access. For example, the, the clusters that you get, um, sorry, the virtual machine you get afterwards, if you start Bitcoin mining there, you won't get the email. I will, because I spun that out for you. And what we have to do is we have to delete all the VMs right away. And we have to restart the whole process again. Um, so when you are working on any of these virtual machines or on a cloud infrastructure, that's something to think about. Um, and finally, they're free to use, and we have like a whole bunch of these specialized pre-configured, that is, we've already installed all these software for you, and it's available. All you have to go in is spin this up and go ahead and start using whatever program. And that's what we mean by the different campers, the different camps of what we There's more listed on our website, ncgas.org. Uh, I never talked about it, but everything I've spoken today, including the material, everything's on our website. It's under development right now, so we can't change a few things, like the workshop page is not complete yet, uh, but email us and we'll be happy to share that information. Any questions about this? So this is Jetstream. It has an atmosphere interface, so you can log, I think it's cloud.jetstream.com. If you go and Google that, you'll come up with this page. Um, in order to access, as I mentioned, you need one, an XC user account, and you need an application. So once you have a user account over here, it's Sherry, so that's a standard. Um, can log in and share the allocation so she can, uh, it shows up. This page shows up, and you can go ahead and get started. If you want access to this and want to try it out, go ahead and email us again. We'll help you, we'll get you on our uh, community allocation, and if you want to do it for a full fledged project, we'll help you with your own allocation. And then uh, I mentioned these pre configured uh, images that we have. So if you click on, like, this is image search. Um, Click on images on the top, and then in the image search, if you write coding units, which is the game you're going to play after this, it'll show up the image that basically has got coding units to show up. So if you write NC gas here, it'll list out everything that we need to solve. Um, there's BC Bio on there, and you, I know all the managing comics with microbial tools because I use them a lot, um, but there's Reno browsers, and I think there's a couple places where we have um, Apache and then yeah, web server. Yeah, web server. So if you want to post a web service, that's so once you have, uh, once you click on these images, you can go ahead and spin them up. These are called images, so we've imaged this instance with everything installed on it. And once you start them up, instead of calling them virtual machine, we call them instance. So it's an instance of a specific image. Just English. Um, I never understood it until I read this. These are different instances. This is an instance of the Pony Linux image. This is the instance of Ubuntu Basic, image, which is what R running. Um, so if you come to our R for Biologies workshop, you're running these for, uh, we're running these on the back end for you, and you're just using a web interface. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so that's it. So when they start spinning up, uh, you'll have this build status, and then once it's active, it turns up a screen, and then we can also shut them out, and we can shut them off from them. It's almost like closing a laptop and putting it into a shell. Um, we can do that. It's just to save the amount of resources we're using. And today, I've basically spun up 10 instances of fully Linux, that's what you'll be accessing. And the good thing about that is I don't have to show you how to you know, set all of this up. I can do all of this. Everything's already installed. There's no software installation for any of you to do. You can just go ahead and get logged in and start working. These have limited resources. Um, I don't think in these slides we show how much, how much like the pre-configured computer sizes you and if you want something more for lots of memory, that's not an option that's given. I think the highest is 100, 
Once you have an image that's active, and this is the Pony Linux image, it says active, and this is the computer size. It's a small computer with one CPU, just two gigs of memory, and eight gigs of uh, storage space. So we don't need a lot for this game, so we don't use a lot, but you can actually make it much bigger. You could open up in a web shell. For example, if you don't know command line, you don't have body, or you don't have an SSH name, you can just click web shell, and it immediately opens up a new tab that takes you to command line for this particular game. So you can go ahead and start writing it in, in your browser. You don't have to message it. You also have the web desktop that's right at the bottom. Um, so if you click on the web desktop that's at the bottom, it'll take you to another browser or another tab. And it's basically point and click. You can play around. This is got only Linux in it, which is nicely here. So if you click on it, a nice download will come up and you can start playing. Too. And if you start clicking, that's what it's done. This is what we'll be doing. Um, this is another thing I should point out. So if I if I spin up all these instances, only I have access to this front end. None of you now have access to this. Um, I can give you the IP addresses, which is right here, and the password and usernames that I've set up on these virtual machines, but you can't access the web shell and the web desktop. That's the only limitation here. So if you were to teach a class, for example, and you want all the participants to have access to this page, you have to have your own allocation, and you have to give all of them access to your allocation and teach them how to spend this. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a couple extra steps, and we didn't have the time for it today. The difference is, um, the advantage to both doing it that way and this way is that as an instructor, I can install everything to an image, for example, in this MATLAB, and every other program I want the students to use, the participants to use, and I'm not troubleshooting during the workshop on software and safety. If any of you ever attended a bioinformatics workshop, generally that is the first step. They will send you a list of programs to install, and you end up spending the whole day one just installing, and everybody's got a different problem, somebody's running a different version. It's a nightmare. So this is the best way to just centralize all that and just do it once and not have to be. And there's also an example to show you that licensed software like MATLAB is available. Uh, we have a specific number of licenses that uh, they bought. So if, let's say, there's 10 licenses they bought and 10 users are using a MATLAB instance, the 11th person has to it just works that way. Um, and then you have the web desktop again, and you have the IP address. So you know, browsers are set up the same way. The backend development is all done. Uh, Shari has done all the backend development. So we will set, all you have to do is essentially spin up the Geno browser we have here, copy the web address, um, the IP address, and add it to a browser over here. And then you have this nice Geno browser. You could go ahead and go inside and then start log. If you're giving a username and password, you can go ahead and log in. And I think we have, once again, documentation on it. So if you have a non log organism and want to play around with your genome and have your own genome browser, that's possible. And it is secure because she does have a login and password. OK. All this is great, but what are the benefits of it? You have root. So how, if, if, how many of you have installed programs? Okay. How many of you have ever gone through a software installation and generally it says do Okay, and you can't do that in a high performance computer. And it's limiting. It's, it's actually annoying because everybody who writes a program probably wrote it on their own computer, so they're able to go in and make like administrative changes to it. On a high performance computing cluster, you can't do that. The ways to get around it is sometimes you just start 
on these virtual machines, that's not a problem. You can just go in and do sudo rf minus rf and delete all the operating system and everything. And, um, so this is awesome. It does mean that you have lots of responsibility as well, but software installation is so much more easy. You can install whatever you need. You don't have to justify it. For example, you send us an email and say, hey, can you install this program system-wide? You don't have to do that over here. You can go ahead and just start um, installing it. But as I mentioned previously, because you're installing it and no one else is waiting, there is no modules as such. You can't do module load over here. You have to deal with the parts and you have to deal with like setting this up in the correct way. Okay. And we'll help you with it. I mean, we will help you as much as you need and you can send out emails about that. It has a user interface. So if you're new to this, you have a nice desktop that you can work with. So it's a little more friendlier than a black screen with just enter commands. Um, it's less intimidating. There's no waiting in line for jobs. This is sometimes one of the big reasons I just didn't take that is I don't have to wait in line for jobs. So let's say that the cluster maintenance is happening and I have a big job to run that doesn't need a lot of memory. I can just spin up a virtual machine, run the job there while you know, everybody else is waiting in queue for that. You can run web servers. And as I mentioned, generally you can't do this on a high performance security cluster. Like you cannot open up your home space world as a website. It's just not allowed. Uh, to do that, you need to email the system admins, like we host um, gateways that are Galaxy, any of you heard of that later. Think about it as um, specialized websites that run bioinformatic analysis. When we host them, we actually have to email the system admins and say, can you give us permission? And they have to give us permission. They have to open up specific ports, and you need to know that much. You need to learn all that in order to host it. Over here, that's none of them. You do whatever you want. You take strips off the internet it up, um, but just be careful about security. So it's great for collaboration, and so now you can lock it down and open it up. And I keep mentioning this, there's something called portals and gateways and web services, um, and I think I use gateways a lot, and these are basically specialized websites that allow uh, bioinformatic analysis. Um, most of these are actually running on cloud systems. Um, ours are running on actual high performance computing environment, but we're also moving towards clouds. Netflix is the same, right? Every time you log into Netflix and you spin it up, you're spinning up essentially a new virtual machine and you use that virtual machine. And it remembers all your like, choices and everything. That's essentially how Netflix is. This is the same thing. So for a gateway, a specialized website, every time you submit a job and you say, I want you to run this particular bioinformatic workflow, it's going to the back end and it's likely taking up a virtual machine and running your analysis. Does that make sense? Um, this doesn't have to be in all cases. Like we do have some machines that are running directly on high performance computing, but in most cases, this is how they're moving. Like this is the trend right now. Um, they're more convenient to run on clouds. Uh, clusters, as I mentioned, all the all the nodes are. They are not. They're not unique. All of them have specific things. That's it. Whereas in clouds, you can actually have one that's running a specific software versus another one that is bigger and that's running more. You know, do a job or something. And it's easier if you need a different operating system. Um, even in Unix and Linux, we have different operating systems. Like, Carrie will install everything on, uh, on CentOS, and I will install everything on Ubuntu. And our commands for root is not the same. So every time I'm working on her virtual machine, I'm angry because I have to change all my commands. Every time she's working on mine, that's the thing. But the beautiful thing about this is now we're allowed to do that. Like, she can actually use um, CentOS on clouds, and I can use Ubuntu. Okay. I kept talking for a whole long time, I'm sure none of you 